This evening we're continuing our overview of Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. And here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we find Paul, he's continuing to deal with those Christians there in Corinth who were allowing a disagreement about leadership to result in a spiritual schism. And knowing that this schism could result in the division uh, of, of the church of Corinth, uh, Paul decided to write this letter in order to challenge them about their carnality. But, but now before we dig into our text tonight, it'll first help us to remember that Paul, he, he took the time to rebuke those believers back in the first two chapters of this book. And the reason why is because they were relying on the limited wisdom of men rather than on the infinite wisdom of God. And now here in our text tonight, here in chapter 3, we find Paul, he's continuing to challenge them, he's continuing to chide them because they were carnal Christians who had already forgotten that the Lord Jesus Christ is the head of the church and not them. Now as we examine the content of this challenging chapter, it's my hope that we are going to spend some time examining our own role here within our fellowship of faith. And as we do, I believe that we should take some time to examine ourselves by asking a very simple question. And the question is this, am I a believer who is helping to build this church according to the leading of the Lord, or am I a carnal Christian who is guilty of causing divisions over debatable things? Well, with this question in mind, let's begin our overview of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And so if you would look with me here beginning at verse 1, here Paul declares, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Here in the opening verses of this chapter, we find Paul, he's calling these Christians out. And he's calling them out because they were carnal Christians. Now, it'll help us to know that the word carnal was translated from a Greek word which could refer to the physical body. And yet, if that's what Paul meant by the word carnal, then he too would have been guilty of being carnal. As a matter of fact, we would all be carnal Christians if it just simply refers to the physical body. But that's not what he was talking about. You see, this word carnal, uh, it comes from this Greek word which was also used when referring to a born-again believer who was living under the control of their baser appetites. And though the Spirit of God is living within the believer, the carnal Christian is still allowing themselves to be ruled by their fallen and their fleshly nature. Not only that, but the carnal Christian is also suffering from an arrested state of development. As a matter of fact, if you would look with me again there at verse 1, there again Paul declares, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, and then he says, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. Here in these verses we find Paul referring to those carnal Christians as babes, babes in Christ. They were little spiritual babies. And, and, and he was basically calling them this. He's saying, hey, you're untaught and unskilled babies. And while we should expect new believers to be babes in Christ, if you're a new believer here tonight, then you're a babe in Christ. You're a brand new believer. You were recently born again. And so you ought to be an untaught, unskilled baby in Christ. But listen, we should also expect believers as they grow up in the Lord uh, to also mature in their faith as they continue to walk with the Lord. If you saw an adult walk into the auditorium right now wearing a diaper and sucking on a bottle, uh, you would think, eh, this person hasn't matured. They should be well beyond diapers and, and bottles, unless they're... Anyway, we'll, we'll just skip over that real quick. Listen, there are many Christians who allow their carnal desires to keep them from developing into mature disciples who are able to chew on the meat of the word. And here in our text today, 
we find Paul, he's describing the effects of this sort of carnality that could cause us to have an arrested state of development. With this in mind, if you would look with me again there at verse 3, there Paul declares, For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal, behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Now, here in these verses, Paul helps us to see that carnal Christians are constantly guilty of envy, strife, and divisions. When we allow ourselves to be trapped in this place of just looking to our baser appetites, then what comes along with that is envy and strife and divisions. It'll help us to know that the word envy there, well, in this context, it speaks of the covetous jealousies that result in rivalries. And as we consider the schismatic situation that Paul was addressing, he was clearly dealing with these carnal Christians who were envious of one another, specifically of leadership positions. They were envious that uh, this believer had this leadership position or that uh, leader had another leadership position, and, and they become envious of those Christians. And listen, envy, the sort of envy that Paul is talking about, it almost always results in strife. Now, the word strife uh, found there in verse 3, it refers to the contentious quarrels which were caused by those who were filled with envy. A person who is filled with envy begins to cause contentious quarrels, which are called strife. And from this, we can see how carnal Christians are not only envious Christians, but they're also ready to cause a spiritual schism through the quarrels that come from strife. And listen, the schisms of strife Well, if left unchecked, they usually result in division. That word division found there in verse 3, it speaks of dissensions that result in a disunion of disciples. And as we put these three words together here, uh, we can see how carnal Christians, they first become envious of one another, and then their envy becomes strife as they begin to, to create this schism with their arguing. And as they attempt to convince everyone else to agree with them and to get on their side, well, they end up causing division. It's sad to say that many churches have ended up splitting simply because believers allowed carnal Christians to infect their churches with envy, strife, which results in division. That being the case, we should take a moment to consider how to deal with carnal Christians who attempt to cause divisions. And with this as our focus, hold your place here in 1 Corinthians 3 and turn with me to Romans chapter 16. As you make your way to Romans 16, I want to take a moment to point out that there's always going to be carnal Christians. It's not something that we can necessarily get away from here on this side of heaven. There's always going to be carnal Christians who attempt to cause division. That being the case, we ought to ask a very important question. And the question that we must ask ourselves is this. Will I allow myself to get caught up in the divisions of carnal Christians, or will I follow the instructions of God's word? Will I allow myself to get caught up in the divisions of carnal Christians, or will I follow the instructions of God's word? With this question in view, if you would look with me here at Romans chapter 16, I want to begin reading at verse 17, because here Paul writes, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions. There's the same word. Note those who cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and, he says, hang out with them all the time and jump on their side. Oh, no, that's not what he says at all. He says, avoid them. Avoid them. He doesn't say, hang out with them. He doesn't say, invite them over for dinner. He says, avoid them. And the reason why, in verse 18, for those who are such, those who cause divisions... Do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, or in other words, their own appetites, and by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. Here in these verses, we find Paul encouraging the Christians there at the church in Rome to note those who are attempting to cause divisions and simply avoid them. You see, those who would attempt to cause divisions here at Calvary South Austin they aren't here to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. They aren't here to serve the Lord's agenda. No, instead, they're simply attempting to force their agenda onto us. 
Therefore, we would do well to simply avoid them. And, and in avoiding them, we reject their divisive ways. You see, if no one jumps on the side of the divisive Christian, then there is no division. There's just one person trying to force their agenda on the church. And if we all just back away from them, they'll either stop it or they'll leave. We would do well to follow the instructions of God's word and avoid divisive Christians. Christian, listen, according to Paul, we should all be here to serve our God. And, and we should all be here to accomplish his holy agenda. As a matter of fact, uh, well, this is our focus. Let's turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where we find Paul, he's presenting this very truth. If you would look with me here, beginning at verse 5. Here Paul asks, who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one. I planted... Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Here in these verses we find Paul, he's reminding the Christians there in Corinth that he wasn't any more important than Apollos, and Apollos wasn't any more important than him. No, instead they simply had different positions there within the body of Christ. Paul had come along and he had planted the seed of the gospel there in the hearts of the people there in Corinth. He had planted the church there in Corinth. And then there was a disciple named Apollos who came along after the fact, and he remained there in Corinth, and, and he watered the church with the word of God and, and helped the, those new believers to begin growing. Now remember, it had come to Paul's attention that those Christians there in Corinth were becoming carnal because they were saying, I'm of Paul, and others were saying, I'm of Apollos. Some were saying, I'm of Cephas, and others were saying, oh, well, I'm of Christ. And with that being the case, Paul wanted to remind them that it's really not important who does the planting or who does the watering. It's not really important who's the one out there planting the seed and who's the one who's hanging back and watering the seed. Now, what's important is that God is the one who makes the seed grow. God is the one who has given us the seed. God is the one who has given us the water to water the seed of the word. God is the one who's important. Therefore, his agenda is the right agenda. Furthermore, Paul went on to remind his readers that we ought to then be working together, not causing division. We ought to be working together in order to accomplish the Lord's agenda. With this in mind, if you would look with me here beginning at verse 8, here Paul declares, Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. Now here in these verses we find Paul presenting us with three examples of the Christian unity that we ought to be experiencing here at our church. First of all, Paul reminds us that we are all God's fellow workers. In other words, we're all co-laborers who have been employed by the same master. And, and the way that uh, a, a business should run is that every employee is doing their part to make sure that the agenda of that company is being accomplished. All the employees or the co-laborers ought to be then working together as one. Therefore, in this sense, uh, Christians who, who go to the same church ought to be working together to accomplish the Lord's agenda for that church. And we ought to be doing this according to our calling in Christ. You're not here to do what you want to do. You're here to do what the Lord wants you to do. And if we would get that uh, into our minds and, and receive that into our heart, then we could get to work doing what the Lord is calling us to do. Now, you might be thinking, well, you know, Bungie's the pastor, and, and that's the most important position, and, and, you know, there's really nothing left for me to do. He's, he takes care of everything, and, and the pastor's position is the most important position. And, and, and let me assure you that while I do have an important position, I believe that every position here at the church is important. Every opportunity to serve is very important. As a matter of fact, Whatever position the Lord has called you to serve in, that is the most important position for you to be in. So yeah, I, I have an important position as the pastor of this church, but listen, I guarantee you 
that when we all need to go and use the church restroom, the most important Christian at that point in time was the servant who took the time to clean the commode prior to our arrival at church. We're hoping that that person thought that their position was the most important thing when they were doing that. And, and if you have kids in the children's ministry, I'm pretty sure that, that you're hoping that that person back in the children's ministry teaching our kids thinks that that's the most important position for them to be in right now. We all need to look at the different opportunities to serve the Lord as the most important position in the church. They're all the most important positions in the church. Christian, listen, we've all been called to become co-laborers who are working together so that together we might accomplish the work of the Lord. Therefore, rather than becoming envious of another Christian's position in the church, I encourage you to just simply discover your calling in Christ, and as you do, get to work and do it. Let's work together to accomplish the Lord's agenda. And while it's true that we should be unified co-laborers in Christ, Paul then went on to reveal Christian unity by referring to the church as God's field. Now, uh, the word field here in our text tonight, uh, it could also be rendered farm. We are the Lord's farm. And while there are many different parts to a working farm, each part is necessary. Each part of, of a fully functioning farm is necessary for that farm to fully function. So to the church. Every part of this church needs to be a fully functioning part in order for this church to work in unity. Thirdly and finally, Paul revealed the unity of the church by referring to every believer as God's building. As we consider this, this building here that, that we're in right now, as we consider the, the structure where we meet, Calvary South Austin, it's easy to see that, that this structure is actually made up of many necessary parts which must all work together and listen, if the front doors of this building suddenly decided that they want to be a wall, they're tired of being a door, they just want to be a wall, well then how could we enter? Or, or, or how could we exit the building? And if the walls suddenly decided that they wanted to be floors and ceilings, then instantly we'd be crushed to death because there would be no walls to support the, the roof above us. Thankfully, everything in this building is doing its part to provide us with a safe place to worship the Lord. And with that being the case, we have to understand we're all God's building. We're all God's building here. Each believer has become a, a, a part of God's building. And so the question that we ought to ask ourselves is this. Am I doing my part to make the spiritual structure of our church a unified place to worship the Lord? Or... Am I a carnal Christian who's allowing envy and strife to cause division? Well, in order to answer this question, we should take some time to examine the blueprints which have been given to Paul. And with this is our focus, look with me here beginning at verse 10. Here Paul declares, According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now here in these verses we find Paul continuing to run with this analogy of the Christian church being likened to a building. You might not know this, but every modern building begins with a design plan which is presented on a set of blueprints. And listen, if it's the builder's responsibility to follow those blueprints to the T. That's the builder's responsibility, to, to take the blueprints that, that have been given and build that. Because listen, if the builder fails to follow the blueprints, then uh, the building might not end up structurally sound. It probably won't. If, if they begin to, to take out certain elements that, that the, the architect placed in there, well, it, it, it might be crucial to the structure. And so the builder, is, uh, their, their responsibility is to follow the blueprints. In similar fashion, as we consider this idea of having blueprints as, as a necessity for design, the, the Lord has given us a set of spiritual blueprints, which will help us to properly fashion God's building, which again is the church. 
And those blueprints can be found within the epistles of the New Testament. In order to prove my point, if you would look with me again there at verse 10, here Paul declares, according to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Now, I should point out that the title, Master Builder, it was actually translated from the Greek word architecton, which is actually the basis for our English word, architect. And so Paul's saying, hey, uh, God has graciously allowed me to be the architect here. And based on this, we can see that, that God is allowing Paul to step in and, and, and be this architect to present us with what? Blueprints. The word foundation in this context here, well, that word foundation was being used in reference to the first principles for an institution or, or system of truth. He's saying, God's given me as the architect the first principles for this system of truth that we call Christianity. And based on this, then, we see that God graciously gave Paul the foundational principles which would become the spiritual blueprints for building the church. If you want to know how we ought to be building the church, then I would point you to the blueprints, or the first principles, which Paul says God gave to him as the architect. With that being the case, Paul encouraged his audience to pay careful attention to his teaching so that we might correctly construct the Christian church according to the blueprints that God has given us. And while it's true that Jesus is the solid foundation of the church, every building has to be built upon a foundation. And Paul says, Jesus Christ is the foundation. It's also important to understand that the foundational principles, which help us to build the church according to God's word, well, they're found in the New Testament epistles, which, uh, of course, were written mainly by Paul. Paul wrote the lion's share of them. But we also find the, the epistles of Peter and John and James and Jude, and these all contain the doctrinal books and the, and the doctrines which are necessary for determining how we should build the, the 21st century church. With that being the case, we must make sure that we're actually fashioning God's building, the church, according to the doctrinal blueprints which can be found in the New Testament epistles. And while there are many reasons for us to, to check out our work against the blueprints of the word, I would suggest that the promise of reward should be a great motivator for every believer. With this in mind, if you would look with me here beginning at verse 12. Here Paul declares, Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so is through fire. Now here in these verses we find Paul referring to the reward, which he actually mentioned in, in brief back in verse 8. And as we examine Paul's encouragement here to, to, to build so that we might receive this reward, uh, we see here that he was continuing to use the analogy of a building project by describing the building materials that we might use as we construct the Christian church. In order to grasp what Paul was saying here, it's important to understand that the Christian co-laborer who serves the Lord, according to the blueprints of the epistles, they're actually fashioning the spiritual structure of the church with the lasting materials of gold, silver, and precious stones. Conversely, the Christian who attempts to build the church according to their own agenda, the Christian who comes along and attempts to force their agenda onto the church, well, they're using building materials which won't last, like wood, hay, and straw. According to Paul, there's coming a day when the holy fire of God is going to test the materials that we used. There's coming a day when the holy fire of God is going to test the materials that we used. Now, I should take a moment to stress that the fire of God is going to test the quality of our works and not the salvation of the worker. Please understand, this holy fire of God tests the quality of our work and not the salvation of the worker. 
The reason for why I'm stressing this point is due to the fact that there are many people who are raised to believe that Christians are going to have to spend some time in purgatory so that the fire of the Lord can cleanse us of the iniquities that didn't get taken care of here in this, in this world. This is one of the verses that the, uh, the Roman Catholic Church actually uses to justify that doctrine of purgatory. Now, if this is something that you were taught, then please notice with me again there in verse 15. There Paul declares, if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Here we see that it's the works of the carnal Christian which are burned up by the fire of God, while the believer himself is saved from the punishment that we deserve. And while this certainly gives every Christian the freedom to build with inferior materials, I would remind you that those who build with gold, silver, and precious stones will eventually receive a reward for our obedience. And so why wouldn't we want to just build with the right materials? The Lord is going to spare us from the punishment that we deserve, praise God. Well, why do we want to waste our time? With the, with the limited time that we have here in this world, why would we want to waste our time building with wood and hay and straw when we could be building with the gold and the silver and the precious stones which will result in everlasting reward? Not only that, but Paul also assures us that the Lord has promised to destroy those who attempt to destroy God's building. With this in mind, if you would look with me there at verse 16, because here Paul asks, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Here in these verses, we find Paul helping his audience to understand that we're not only God's building, but to be more specific about it, we are God's temple. We're not just any old building. He, uh, Paul doesn't refer to us as, as the strip center mall. You know, we're, we're not just some, you know, some basic brick and mortar building. No, the church is the temple of God. And listen, this Greek word translated temple, it was used when referring to the sanctuary there in Jerusalem. And that sanctuary, well, it included the holy place and the Holy of Holies. That's the word temple that he's using here in this text. So Paul takes this word temple that, that refers to the, to the sanctuary there in Jerusalem, which included the holy place and the Holy of Holies, and he says, you're the temple. Now, I've heard people referring to this room of Calvary South Austin as the sanctuary. This is not the sanctuary. Christian, you are the sanctuary. I am the sanctuary. The Holy Spirit has taken up residence not in this structure that we meet in, but rather within the very body of the believer. The Spirit of God who was once made manifest there in the Holy of Holies of Jerusalem now resides within the body of the born-again believer, individually as well as collectively and corporately. Now, in light of this truth, we should consider what Paul meant there in verse 17 when he declared, if anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. In order to understand this verse, I should point out that the anyone that Paul mentioned there in the beginning of verse 17, well, it's referring to any person who's not part of the temple of God. Notice again, if anyone defiles the temple of God, who are we, Christian? We are the temple of God. And if anyone attempts to destroy the temple of God, God will destroy, notice there, him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. So he's talking about a him or a them or an anyone outside of the temple of God, and he's comparing that to the temple. If anyone else outside of the temple of God attempts to destroy the temple of God, God is going to destroy us. And I should point out that where it says, if anyone defiles the temple of God, that word defiles comes from the same Greek word as the word destroy there. So he's saying, hey, if any unbeliever attempts to destroy the temple of God, God's going to see fit to destroy them. 
So if you've been born again by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, you're part of the temple of God. And with that being the case, Paul's assuring his Christian audience here that any person who attempts to destroy the church, it won't work out well for them. The righteous wrath of our almighty God will bring just holy punishment on those who would destroy the church. What this means then is that the Lord loves his church. And he loves us so much that he's promised to defend us against anyone who seeks to destroy us. And while it's true that his grace has covered the sins of every believer, which includes all of our envy, it includes all of our strife, it includes all of our divisiveness, the Lord has promised to cover all of those sins, and he has done so. At the moment of our salvation, we were covered with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's how much he loves us. And while he's ready to to continue to to cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness, we have to understand that he's also called us to serve his agenda, not our own. He's called us to serve his agenda so that we might avoid the damage which would be caused by our own divisiveness. And with this as our goal, let's consider the instructions that Paul presented here in the final verses of this chapter. If you would look with me beginning at verse 18. Here Paul declares, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come, all are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. Now here in the final verses of this chapter, we find Paul addressing those there at the church in Corinth who assumed that they were wise enough to to force their own agenda upon every other believer, because that was the situation that was happening. These Christians were coming along and saying, well, I... Uh, this is the way the church ought to run, and these are the leaders that should be in place. And they were attempting to force their own agenda onto the church because they thought they were just super smart. And so Paul's saying, hey, look, if you, if you really think you're that smart, then become a fool. Rather than telling them, hey, you're so smart, why don't you put together a proposal and you can present it to the board and we can have a democratic vote and, and, and maybe it'll go your way. And, and No, he didn't direct them in that way at all. Instead, he directed them to recognize the foolishness of their worldly wisdom so that they might begin to grow in godly wisdom. The minute we can just recognize that our finite wisdom is foolishness compared to God's infinite wisdom, then we can have the humility to recognize that my thoughts, my plans, it's foolishness. Therefore, let's set aside our agenda to recognize that God's plan is the best plan. His agenda is the right one. It's the best one. Furthermore, Paul also addressed those who were dividing the church by creating some sort of ecclesial hierarchy according to a a, a believer's spiritual association. Remember, uh, they were saying, well, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, Peter. And so while these divisive disciples were busy dividing the church over the names that they knew, well, I was discipled by this guy, or I was baptized by that guy, Paul decided to conclude this this chapter by reminding them that we shouldn't be about any of these guys' agendas. He's saying, look, Paul, who's Paul? Who's Apollos? Who's Peter? Let's not make the church about the agenda of Paul. Let's not make the church about the agenda of Apollos or Peter or Bungie. Let's make sure that our church is about Christ's agenda. The reason why is based on the fact that the born-again believer, well, we've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. Grasp that for a moment. The born-again believer has been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, we belong to him. You don't belong to me. I don't belong to you. We don't belong to Peter or Paul or Apollos. 
Christian, we belong to Jesus. We've become the bondservants of Jesus Christ. And as the bondservants of Jesus Christ, let's set aside our agendas, let's forget about our divisions, and let's commit ourselves to accomplishing the agenda of the Lord according to the blueprints that he's given us, which can be found in his holy word.